Welcome to one of the best times to be out in the African bush just before the sun pops up over the eastern horizon. We're in search of lions that were calling to the east uh, and this is Safari Live. Impala! I suddenly thought I saw something in the distance there, and uh, but it is Impala crossing the road. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to this wonderful Sunday sunrise safari. My name is Brent, and on camera with me is Brian and the Thumb, and the killer bees are out and about in search of lions. And I heard the lions roaring probably about a kilometer and a half from here. They could be just across our northern boundary. I know James did follow a female across the northern boundary yesterday. Fingers crossed they've decided that the holiday in the north is over and they're on their way south back to Juma. And it is a beautiful morning and there's a few little wispy clouds around but I think it's going to be an absolutely stunning day and hopefully lots and lots of interesting things to see. Now remember, we're on a live African safari. Uh, those in Parla were crossing the road live. Hopefully we're going to find some lions live. And uh, we also are able to take questions, which is incredible. So wherever you might be sitting in the world, please feel free to ask us questions by using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or pop us an email on questions at wildearth.tv. Now, we have been really lucky with the amount of lions we've had out and about recently. The Inkahuma Pride have eight cubs, and they seem to be utilizing Juma as a, the best place to keep those cubs. It is the safest place for those cubs. It is in the, the center of their range, the core part of their home range. So very unlikely that they're going to get any pressure from other lions. And of course, at the moment, very few hyenas, so it's a great place to be keeping your babies. Now we're going to keep marching onwards towards the east and the rising sun while we do that. I know James is heading out looking for leopards in the west, so let's go see how his morning is going so far. Good morning, good morning everybody and welcome to your Sunday Sunrise Safari. That is three alliterations there, um, Eggsy. Yeah, it's very nice. It's a very simple uh, grammatical little tool that uh, not particularly interesting. Anyway, my name is James. Eggsy is on camera and it's good to have you with us here on this beautiful Sunday. Apparently it's about 16 degrees uh, Celsius, 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. I think it's probably about accurate. And normally the weather report here is absolute nonsense, but I think today that's okay. We're heading down south here, hoping to pick up tracks, perhaps, of the mating pair of leopards that was around yesterday. Don't know where they are. They went into Arethusa last night, but they are kind of mobile when they're in the state of courtship. So we'll see if they come back this way. Also, maybe Karula may have come back this way. So that's the idea for this morning. In the meantime, have a look to the east there. At the... Well, I suppose slightly oranging sky in what is a bit of a grey dawn and a bit of mist hanging in the valley of the great Umluamati drainage. The rest of the country experiencing quite a lot of rain yesterday. And I think this, that sort of bank of grey cloud there that you can see is possibly the front that dumped all over the rest of the country now moving up through here. Um, South Africa, of course, experiences most of its weather uh, at time of the year from the Cape. So it comes in from the Cape, hits the Cape, uh, comes up the interior, batters the Drakensberg escarpment, and sort of leaks down over the escarpment, and then somehow it manages to make its way around to the, from the, the side of the Drakensberg and up from the southeast in this particular area. And that's what that is there. 
I think. Okay, let us keep going. We have not seen any animals yet, except for one very startled diker, who seemed most pleased to have made it through the evening. If I was a diker, I would be most pleased also to have made it through the evening. Not that I'm not pleased to have made it through the evening as a human being. Now, we're as live as Brent, so please do give us your questions and comments. We had some wonderful chat yesterday evening. Um, <laughs> no, really, any animal, so we had to have some wonderful chat. So thank you very much to all of you who were part of yesterday evening's game drive. And hopefully we'll have a few more animals to talk about today. So please do talk to us, hashtag Safari Live, if you're tweeting, or questions at wildearth.tv if you're emailing. Like I say, do not try and telephone us, do not try and send us a postcard or a handwritten letter. The postal service here, a thing of great distress. Otherwise, not much going on. The dawn chorus, very quiet as usual for this time of year. I'm still looking for my first Wahlberg's equal, everyone. Very distressingly, Eggsy managed to ruin my day the other day. I thought I had spotted it. It landed. It turned out to be a tawny eagle. And Eggsy was very, very, um, what should we say, uh, insistent on holding the camera perfectly in frame so that we could see that it was, in fact, a tawny eagle. He was not content to let me live with my fantasy. So I have yet to see a Wahlberg's eagle this year. <clears throat> it's quite late now for them to get back. For those of you who don't know, a Wahlberg's eagle, a migratory eagle that disappears probably around hmm, April, I think they went this year. And then they're normally one of the first migrants back in this area, but they have not returned yet. Obviously, it's been a good year in central equatorial Africa or sub-Saharan. And the best thing about their return, of course, is the fact that they come back to the same nests and so we see the same birds. Hello, Oki from Oklahoma. You want to know if birds snore? You say... <laughs> You say you thought you heard some snoring at the uh, at the Juma Dam cam during the course of the night. Okie, okay, I'm going to say no. I don't think birds do snore. I've never heard a bird snore before. I've seen a couple that have been asleep. I think you're hearing other things at the pan there. There's much going on. Uh, with the warming temperatures and the bit of moisture that there is there, you'll get a strange frog that makes sounds that make sound like um, snoring. Snoring puddle frog, for example. Might have a few of them there. Uh, could be some crickets. Could be a sort of a, some dust on the microphone that's making things sound like snoring. So now I'm pretty sure it wasn't a bird sleeping next to the microphone going Could have been one of us from the camp snoring very loudly and perhaps that floated down to the microphone. Now, we're just going to get to the southern boundary here and see if those leopards haven't come back. I've been startlingly unsuccessful at finding leopards the last little while. It's been very distressing for my heart. Not really. I remember as a guide used to feel I used to feel tremendous pressure to try and show people the animals that they wanted to come and see. And there is so much luck involved in what we do that you really can't afford to feel too much pressure about the whole thing. All right, we're going to just stop in here and then we're going to have a listen because we've got a lovely view out over the Drakensberg. And we'll see if we can hear any birds calling and perhaps the dreadfully terrifying sound of mating leopards. Exe, off to the western side is the Drakensberg. I'm going to stop here and then I would ask you very kindly to point your camera to the west. That's to the right hand side of the view. Thank you so much. And there it is. You can see a very misty morning there off to the west. Now let us be quiet and see what we can hear. A couple of drongos. One or two robins. 
and way in the distance you may have just picked up a fish eagle calling, probably at the Arethusa Dam. But no growling, snarling, and sniffling from the mating leopard pair. All right, we're going to do a little loop around here. While we do that, let's go to Brent and see how his lion tracking is progressing. Now, we're in the area where I thought those calls were coming from, so we're just going really slowly, trying to see if we can spot some tracks. Now, they were just inside Buffalo's Hook, about here on the sunset safari yesterday. So let's see, let's hope for tracks going that way, which there are. Mm. Let's have a look down at the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Now, I just want to carefully look at these tracks because it could have been the lioness heading down to pick up the cubs because I only see one lioness track so far. It's still worth having a look at the water hole. Hi, Ellen. Ellen is in Arkansas, and Ellen is wondering, do I think the hyenas moved their den away to protect their cubs because the lions were spending more time in the area? Uh, Ellen, I actually think it's uh, the other hyena clan that has forced them to move a bit. So the Elephant Plains Sibambili hyena clan seem to be coming quite far to the east, and they're a much bigger clan than the Juma clan. So as far as I know, the Juma clan has moved onto into the southern Manuleti, uh, but I, I'm not sure. I would say it's more likely to do with the other hyenas than it is with the lions. Okay. Oof, there's a bank of cloud just came out of nowhere. I've you know, been looking down for tracks, look up, and suddenly we've got cloud overhead. And here we go, we're at the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Just having a quick look for tracks. But I think that track coming down is of the lioness coming to pick up the pride. Let's check it a little bit further. So we can see up that little river system that comes into the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Nope. And let's head back towards the northern boundary. Let's see if we get any tracks coming across. Kevin, Kevin said there's been quite a lot of hyena activity around the Juma Pan, and does that mean the hyenas could be denning back on Juma again? It is possible, but uh, we've checked a lot of the dens, and I wouldn't say there's enough activity and enough audio for us uh, to, to say that they're back on Juma. Uh, you must remember, hyenas walk vast distances in their nightly patrols, so I just think, I just think they're, they're on the move around but I don't think it's uh, that they've moved their den back onto Juma. Hopefully I'm wrong. Of course, we'd love to have the hyenas back. Okay, so there were no, just that single track, I think that's of the lioness going to fetch the rest of the cubs uh, that you saw with James on the Sunset Safari. So we're gonna loop around back onto the northern boundary to see if there are any tracks coming south 
a bit further to the east. Okay, so I'm going to be checking very carefully. Taxon, who had the lions inside Buffalo's hook, exactly where he had. Tax, tax. Taxi, uh, the Angala, were they opposite uh, that eastern access road to Buffalo's hook dam? Okay, copy, thanks very much. Um, I've just passed the western side. I saw the vehicle and Konzo going north. I'm going to keep checking the cheetah cut line, but so far, no and Konzo coming back to the south. Copy, thanks very much. All right, so Tax is inside Buffalo's Hook, checking opposite us to see if they didn't head a little bit further to the north. Now, I made a silly mistake this morning. Brian looked at me and sort of shook his head in disbelief. It was so warm on yesterday's sunrise safari that I was like, well, you know what? It's the first morning. I'm not going to wear long pants. I'm going to wear shorts, but I'm really regretting it now. I've got to have my blankets because it is very chilly. I think it's probably around 14. Maybe, how, do you, how cold do you think it is, Brian? Uh, around there, maybe yeah, 13, 14 degrees Celsius, which is definitely long pants weather in my book. Brian, of course, is in his long pants with an extra double thick blankie. Just an impala up ahead is not birding well for our lion tracking. There we go. Hello, Mbalalas. Seen any lions, guys? I'm oh, full of the joy of morning. Woodpecker in the distance. You can see the impala puffed up, raising their fur as they often do when it's cold. Now, there must have been a big party. I can still hear the party going in, in the village. There's this deep bass line coming across the African door. Doom, 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 doom. Let's keep checking up to the end. If no luck, we're going to have to formulate a new plan. Tracks. No tracks. Of course, there'd be one thing better than tracks, and that would be the lions themselves. 
and we keep searching for either. Uh, let's see how James is faring in the southwest. We are going north now, everybody. We're going up the main sort of access road here of um, real Wasabi Sands, really. And the interesting update is that they have... Sorry, there's just so much going on in the radio here. Um, the <laughs> I'm going to pull that out of my ear because now I can actually think straight. On Arethusa, there's a young male leopard who's just crossed the boundary south towards uh, Ma um, Londolosia. I thought maybe it might be Sindile. It is not Sindile. Apparently, an unidentified young male, perhaps a male they call the rock drift male, who's been lurking around these parts. So that's an interesting update. No track so far of Tingana and Shadow, so I think they're probably still to the south of us. We're going to sort of make our way down south again inside Arethusa and see if we don't pick up something there. Otherwise, who knows? Otherwise, we have seen one diker. We did see another diker. That's two diker today, Eggsy. Well done. That's wonderful return for the afternoon, at least for the morning. In fact, I think we're not going to go... I think we're going to go towards Red Dam first, and then south in Arethusa. So that's the update. No lions have been found yet. And also, apparently, Ellen Fowler says, I think she's staying at Arethusa. She's a long-time viewer. And she is, she said she saw Shadow's cub yesterday. Now, that's very interesting. Uh, Ellen was giving the update. She isn't at Arethusa, sorry. Ellen was giving the update that another long-time viewer saw um, Shadow's cub yesterday on her own. So that's interesting, isn't it? I think we are coming closer to understanding why Shadow has never successfully raised a cub before. So for those of you who perhaps don't know, or you may be new viewer, Shadow, a nine, it must be ten by now, surely. I don't know when her tenth birthday is, but nine or ten-year-old female leopard never raised a youngster to independence, and it seems that she keeps coming into estrus before they get anywhere near sort of independence age. Now, it's not unusual for a... F well, it is unusual, but it's not impossible for a female leopard to go independent at age eight months. But at the moment, we have a situation where she's got a... The cub will be seven months old pretty much the beginning of next, uh, next week, right? Next month. Yes, next month. It'll be seven months old and already Shadow is mating with another female. And normally, they don't come into estrus. The aerial is languishing, f facing the ground. Um, normally, they don't come into estrus until the cub has gone independent, and that just has not happened yet. It didn't happen with her last cub, Sindila, so I don't know. And now, unfortunately, that male leopard has now crossed south. I was going to try and get us in there, but it's not going to be possible. So we're going to go to Red Dam, which is just up here, see what's going on there, and then we'll head down towards the south, and maybe we'll pick up Shadow and Tingana, or maybe something else, Eggsy, other than one diker, perhaps. Two diker, sorry. I do apologize, casting aspersions on our immense game viewing talents here. Also, in this general vicinity, we often see a very um, confiding, very confiding warthog sounder. So maybe we'll be lucky enough to see them. Now, Chai, Chai Town Chani? What? what? Thai Town Connie. Thai Town Connie. Hello, Titan Connie. You say, what is my favorite species of antelope? My favorite species of antelope, Titan Connie, is a Nyala. And I just think they're rather special to look at. They are beautiful red colors. The females, the males, a gorgeous charcoal gray with a mane of white hair and spectacularly spiraling horns. Yeah, I think they're by far and away my favorite antelope. <coughs> I shall show you some if we see them. You'll we'll stop and appreciate their magnificence.
Right, here we are at Red Dam. Waterhole is always a nice sort of focal point for you to go to and from. It's not necessarily that not necessarily that there's going to be anything extra there, but they're nice sort of places to go and sort of centre your game drives on. In the same way that Brent went to Buffelshook Dam to start with. It's now Buffelshook Mud Wallow, soon to be Buffelshook Dust Bowl if we don't get some rain. But maybe with this front moving in, there'll be a bit of moisture coming out of the sky. Oh, the hive of activity over here, Eggsy. You're not going to know where to point the camera. Isn't that amazing? Look at that. Good grief. The Sunday excitement is unparalleled. <laughs> One blacksmith lapwing. There it is. Have you seen anything else, Lapwing? Hmm? No. One hyena during the night, he says, everyone. Otherwise, not much. Ooh, and Eggsy, if we look to the left-hand side there, you've got Hornbill sitting on some fresh... Ex we had a Hornbill sitting on some fresh excavations of a termite mound. Thank you, thank you for that. Thank you, off you go, have a nice Sunday. Thanks for helping us out there. What there is here, everyone, is a very nice knobthorn tree. And this knobthorn tree is nice because it has put its flowers where even me, I of such short stature, am able to reach them and smell them and enjoy their gorgeous scent. So let me go and retrieve some for you so that you too might enjoy the scent of the knob thorn. If I can just get this uh, earpiece out. Can't get it in, can't get it out. It's all a bit of a technical disaster. Can you still hear me, Eggsy? Yes, you can. Good, good. Can you still hear me now, Eggsy? Two things I'm going to bring you, Eggsy. Are you excited? Yes, good. The first thing is this freshly excavated mud from the termite mound. Can you see it there? Yeah. It's that brown stuff on my hand. Well done. Now that water that the termites have got there comes from somewhere under the surface of the soil. And so often the termites, or almost always the termites, mound will go down to the water table wherever that happens to be and you can see it's quite clay rich, it sticks together. There are no termites in it. It doesn't smell of anything. Now, oh look at this. See how I'm framing myself. The smell is delicious. Take a deep breath, everybody. Very good. And it just infuses the whole air around these knobthorn trees with the first subtle spring smells. There you are, Eggsy. Nice, huh? There we are. Okay. Let's carry on. Let me re-plug myself in. Summer I do find from a dressing point of view much easier, as I'm sure we all do. I don't have quite so much paraphernalia that my wires can get stuck in. Okay. On we go. Leggy blanky. It's not very cold. Just cold enough for a leggy blanky. All right, while we leave here, we're going to head down south now, see if we can't pick up something else. Let's go and find out what Brent is doing and where he is. So we've checked the almost 
the whole eastern boundary so far. It sounds like the Inkahumas have unfortunately been located inside Buffalo's Hook. Um, not quite sure. They're probably about a kilometer from the boundary. So Brian and I have decided to throw the luck dice and we're going to head east towards Cheetah Plains, see if there's anything happening down there. I haven't been down there for a while, so quite exciting to see what's out there. Now, I haven't seen a good cheetah sighting in ages, so fingers crossed. And of course, there's always a chance that the sticks pride, uh, as well as a few leopards. Oh, I was hoping it was going to land. Juvenile battle here. Oh, beautiful camera work, Brian. Okay, so there we go. A battle here. One of the snake eagles. Also, one of the first animals generally to find a kill before the vultures. Always before we carry on any further, I'm going to just swing the car around. And there we go. A beautiful African sunrise. Also a great time to just listen for a second. All I can hear is the hoop 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 of an African hoopoo. Boop boop boop. Boop boop. Calling to each other. And also hear that battalier calling behind us. And of course, the raucous dawn chorus of the crested Franklin. Now, let's hope that that sun's going to burn off this cloud. So my choice to wear shorts will be justified by the end of the sunrise safari. So no sign of lion, no sign of leopard. Oh, I just want to listen to this. This is for the east. Okay, so no sightings in the east either yet. So let's go find some. So while we get on the long road to the east, let's go see James, who's got, oh, sorry. He's got a striped donkey. There it is, everybody, the beautiful sunrise and in the silhouetted light of the ginger dawn. See how poetic I am on Sundays, Eggsy, is a Birchall's zebra. The plain zebra, the most common zebra that we find out here. In fact, the only zebra that we find out here, but the most common zebra in South Africa. One of two species that we find here, the other being the Cape Mountain zebra, which, in my opinion, is an infinitely inferior-looking creature to the one you are looking at now. The Cape Mountain zebra looks like a donkey. This looks like a fairly well-muscled horse, I feel, and I'm afraid the donkey and the mule inescapably less good-looking than the horse. And I suppose, you know, the Cape Mountain Zebra does come from the Cape, 
and so is inescapably defective. Not so eggsy. Yes, good. I am, of course, being entirely sarcastic. Some things from the Cape are not defective. Eggsy is not very defective, and he's certainly becoming less so uh, the more time he spends with us. <laughs> That's really lovely colouring, don't you think? I don't think that that cloud is going to burn off particularly permanently. I think there is a front coming in, but I might be proved wrong. I'll be very happy to be proved wrong. And let's just try and get an idea, once Eggsy has stopped being artistic, of what this zebra <laughs> is eating. Very artistic, Eggsy. Well done. It's still looking for grass. You know, many of the grazers are having to turn to browse at this stage. But the zebras having to find grass and still managing to find grass amazingly. They will be looking forward very greatly to the first sprinklings of the spring rain. And you can also see, I don't know if you can see, oh, you can't really see there, I suppose, with the lens that we have on now, that it's eating long grass. It's eating quite a lot of structural material, that kind of strawy stuff that it, the grass is used to stick up the fl inflorescences. It's also eating roots, which many grazers can't cope with. So zebra's quite good at doing that sort of thing because, of course, they don't have the limit. They don't have a space limit like a ruminant does. They're able to, um, they're able to just, you know, the hungrier they get, the more they can process. The worse the forage gets, the more they process. And so while their digestive systems are not particularly efficient in the same way that a ruminants is, that a ruminants are, I can't work out the English there. Their digestive systems are not as effective as a ruminants are, I think. Okay. Well, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> but they are very good at processing very poor quality forage. Good. There we are. Andrew? Yes, I would say they probably do. You say, do, uh, do zebra ever give birth to stillborn young? Yes, I'm sure they do. Um, I think it probably does happen. I suspect it happens less often than it does with human beings. But um, yes, I'm sure it happens. I think also you'll find, oh dear, zebra seems to have got himself rather horribly caught. Oh dear. Phew. You don't like to see that because zebra, rather like horses and any other antelope, will panic if they get caught. And they'll just start pulling. And then they can do themselves a horrible injury. Yeah, he seems to be okay. So, you know, with stillborns and any kind of birth problems, um, I think it's it's... You know, because of human beings, and there must be a gen genetic component to birth troubles. We know that human beings, for example, um, a breech birth is not uncommon. But we also know that, you know, 200 years ago, a breech birth would have resulted in death for probably mother and baby. Whereas now, it's not an issue at all. Uh, out here, a breech birth will almost certainly result in death for both. And uh, if there is a genetic component for um, that causes an animal to give to have a breech birth, obviously those genes will then be bred out of the population. In human beings, of course, that is not the case with the advances in medical science. So I think you'll find that a lot of birth difficulty uh, is excluded by the fact, or the genetic component of birth difficulties are excluded by the fact that these animals don't have any medical care. The second thing, of course, is that human beings are inescapably poorly designed for giving birth. This is because we are bipedal, which means the birth canal runs through the hips as opposed to out the back of them. Our hips are at 90 degrees to any other animal or any other sort of quadruped, and that means that birth is very dangerous for women, much more so than it would be in just about any other species. 
and I think you'll find that up until fairly recently human beings or human being women have a much higher attrition rate due to birth than any other mammal. So not an easy thing. Obstetrics in the human being? Right, I think we've seen enough of that zebra having his breakfast. I'm becoming quite peckish looking at him. So this has continued down to the south. We, of course, have seen a zebra giving birth live. That was David and I. It was a wonderful experience. I've never seen an animal giving birth before. All of my colleagues up to that point had seen it, and I had not. So it was a great joy to behold. Sorry, this microphone. I'm, I may well lose my temper with this microphone at some stage during the morning and fling it into the bush. In which case, I shall just have to shout into the... Uh, into the back microphone. But because it's Sunday, I'll try not to lose my temper. Hello, Marley G in Illinois. Oh, look at that kudu standing on top of the termite mound. Isn't she beautiful? Hello. She's coming closer. That's very unusual for a kudu. Marley G, while we watch this browser, you want to know the difference between a browser and a grazer? Well, watch carefully, and this kudu is going to answer your question for you. Remember what you saw that zebra eating? A grazer eating grass? Watch the kudu here. A kudu is a browser. Just keep watching. All shall be revealed. And there, the kudu's colleagues. And they're eating leaves. You see that, Mariji? So it's leaves from trees, is what browsers are. Some are mixed feeders. Most are specialists in one or the other, browsing or grazing, because you need a slightly different suite of enzymes and bacteria in the gut to cope with the different plants that you eat especially as tree leaves are probably more protein rich than grass leaves but they do carry with them a tremendous number of chemical defensive mechanisms which are particularly difficult to digest so while some grazers will certainly try and browse if they if they have to in a dry season like this they will almost certainly try and get their sort of specialist food before they turn to the food of others Again, that lovely subtle winter colour there of the kudu browsing in the thicket. And we're not having too much luck down here in Arethusa, I'm afraid. Uh, but that's not got anything to do with Arethusa. And you can hear in the background the woodwind section firing up. The sound of the long-tailed shrikes or magpie shrikes calling. Not sure what they're singing at. Uh, probably each other. It's probably a territorial dispute. I'm just... Gosh, I think we've sorted the microphone problems, everybody. I know you've all been dreadfully worried about it. Not so easy. Yes, exactly. All righty, let's continue on our way to the south. And as I said, Rebecca, those birds, the magpie shrikes, probably in the middle of a territorial dispute with each other. They are flocking birds. And the flocking birds are often they're often sort of territorial. 
and when two flocks meet each other on a territorial boundary, they will shout and scream at each other like those ones are doing. Just keep an eye out and make sure they're not alarming. Hello, Jean. Very nice question. You want to know if female great apes have the same trouble giving birth as humans do? They don't because their hips are not designed in the same way that ours are. So our, our hips, if you think of a quadrupedal animal, so an animal that is, uh, well, has four feet. I'm just going to quickly show you these magpie shrikes if they can, if I can find them. And they are still shouting at each other. So see that they're not shout. They do alarm call at predators. I didn't see any predators. We may as well just do a turn up here. If you think of a quadrupedal mammal, the birth canal um, sits... Oh, how do I best describe this? Well, let's do it with a picture. I'm not going to draw you a picture because I'm hopeless at that sort of thing. Uh, let's take... Well, let's just take this... This is obviously not a female animal. There is the birth canal on a mammal, right? There are the hips, they come down like that, and the birth canal goes out that way. In a human being, that situation, remember, is, is shifted by 90 degrees, so the animal's body shifts up. So we stand upright, which means that our spine is shifted 90 degrees there, and the birth canal, instead of going uh, sort of out behind the hips, must go through them. And the great apes don't have that problem. The great apes are quadrupedal, they're not bipedal. Yes, they can stand on their back feet if they have to, but then they eventually will have to, they can't move for lengthy periods on their back feet because it's just uncomfortable because their hips and their spine, the way the hips and the coccyx are attached to the spine, very different from the way that it is with human beings. And that's why it's dangerous for humans and not for the great apes. There are these birds shouting at each other. They don't seem to be shouting at a predator. I think it's two flocks. There's the one flock there, eggsy to the left-hand side of where you're looking. Now, it's definitely a little territorial dispute here. You see the ones on the left there? There's lots of them there. So there are a whole lot more. And they're doing what we call flag waving. Well, they were doing what we call flag waving. They were sitting on the branches and opening their wings and flapping them and then shouting at the other flock. There we go. Go to the, go to the right hand side slightly. There, there, there. Those ones there. Just have a look at those. They were doing the flag waving display. And now they're not, obviously. And another interesting example here of birds where male and female are not sexually dimorphic, they look exactly the same, but they both have this seemingly strange long tail that defers no evolutionary advantage that I can pick up on. A long tail is difficult to fly with. So why they should have it, I don't know. Why the female should take the same risk as the male, we're not sure. Look there, they're flag waving on the ground there. Oh, I keep missing it every time they do it. Eggsy's on <laughs> some that aren't doing it. <laughs> now they're stopped, obviously. Look at them hopping there. <laughs> there, there we go. Some flag waving, everybody. There might be an element of courtship here, you know. That's interesting. We are getting to the mating season for birds. And I think... No. <laughs> I think in a flock like this, there's an alpha pair normally, and the rest are kind of helpers. Oh, they're being attacked by virtual starlings. This is such a beautiful little sighting.
Hello, Siberia Zumi. You want to see if we can't find all of the starlings that you can find at this time of year today? Yes, we can certainly try and do that. Um, they're all here. The only one I'm pretty sure we won't see because they are... Well, they're not migratory, but they're nomadic and therefore don't occur here very often. Ooh, that was a big dive bomb there. Is the wattled starling, but I think the greater blue... Oh, and we also won't see the plum colored because they aren't here. But we might see the greater blue eared glossy, the cape glossy, and we've seen the birchals. I will certainly try and find the others for you as well. Very, very interesting bird situation here. So I think two flocks of long-tailed or magpie shrikes having a territorial dispute, flag-waving at each other on a territorial boundary. Perhaps there's some sort of food source here. And I wonder if the starlings don't want to eat the food source. Although that's a starling alarm call as well, you know. I'm going to sneak forward and just see if there isn't perhaps a snake or a bird of prey somewhere around here like an African hawk eagle or perhaps a little sparrow hawk lizard buzzard no I can't see anything here we're just going to get a little bit up the road Bruce, you say maybe the long tail helps other birds of the same species spot them easily. Yep, I think that could be one of the explanations. It just doesn't explain then why all birds don't have long tails. You know, if it works for one, it often works for the other. So if mm, grey-headed sparrows can spot each other with long tails, without long tails, why do these ones need long tails, especially as they don't... These are, you know, they're floppy tails. It doesn't give them any advantage for flying. In fact, it probably makes flying a lot more difficult. So, yeah, I'm not sure. It's a little bit like the story of the lilac-breasted roller, where the female is the same color as the male. Those colors make them more obvious to potential predators. It doesn't really make any sense to me why they should be both that color. And maybe it had, does not have an evolutionary reason. Maybe it's just a... Uh, maybe it's sexual selection that's that's driven them that way. I don't know. I don't know. Right, no leopards so far. We would have stopped for them if we'd seen them. Hello, Robin. You want to know what the magpie shrikes eat? Well, magpie shrikes are... Oh, well, they're obviously shrikes. And therefore, they eat meat. But that meat can be insects, it can be probably s small reptiles, they're not very big those chaps, so probably small reptiles, maybe the odd snake, possibly the odd very small frog, but it will be largely insects, grasshoppers, that sort of thing, and termites, I imagine. This time of year, whatever they can. Right, let us move slowly down here. And this is the vicinity into which I thought maybe those leopards would have come. Not, maybe not. Something would be nice, though. Some elephants, perhaps. I can't believe we didn't see any elephants yesterday at all. Much evidence of elephants by way of broken down trees and chewed off bark. There we are, Eggsy, you see? All right, never mind. <laughs> Hello, Andrew, you want to know what the silliest bird I've witnessed is? That's a very good question. I have seen some silly birds in my time. Um, trying to think. When you said that, I immediately thought, yes, I do know exactly, but then I stopped knowing. 
if you know what I mean. There is definitely a bird. I would say probably um, there's a close tie between the Egyptian goose and the hardy dar ibis. And it's mainly to do with the sounds they make. There are some impala, which we'll stop at because we haven't seen anything else. The Egyptian goose, Andrew, spends a lot of time in great conversation and debate. And the male and female pairs fly around shouting at each other for hours on end. And it's quite, it's very amusing to watch them. And then there's the hardy dar ibis, which lives in flocks, and they have a deep need to communicate with each other from very close distances at very high volume. And they always have a kind of bemused look of confusion on their faces as they go, <coughs> sitting right next to each other. And I've always thought they were rather silly. And you might just be able to hear in the background there some ox peckers going Here they come. They're probably going to land on these impala. Don't worry about trying to get, get them on camera exit. Let's see if they land on the impala or if they've given up and they've seen something else. Here they come. No, they're going to land on this tree here. There they are on the top of the tree where the starling is, another virtual starling, and they'll be looking for nesting spots as well. Virtual starlings and oxpeckers both like to nest in old woodpecker holes. And in fact, you know, the one, there's one that seems to be investigating a hole. In fact, it's disappeared. It's in there somewhere, but it's moved into, I think it's in a hole. Just keep watching there. Yeah, that one. It went in there. There it is. You can just see it moving on the right-hand side. Maybe it's a heavily grid female. Maybe she's ready to lay her eggs. This it does turn out to be a nest. It'll be my third one. That's very unusual for me to have found so many nests. No, it's given up. It's just enjoying the warmth of the Sunday sun. Very nice. These are red-billed oxpeckers, one of two species that we get here, of course. The other being the yellow-billed oxpecker, which tends to be on larger animals like giraffe and buffalo. Seldom on anything else. Cattle, if you go further north of us. Ali, you want to know if I've ever been dive-bombed by a bird? I certainly have been dive-bombed by a bird. Um, I was dive-bombed for the first time as a young boy walking down the, what was it, one, two, three, third fairway uh, when my father was trying desperately to teach me, um, <laughs> teach me how to play golf. Poor fellow failed. And I was probably about ten and we were dive-bombed by a number of crowned lapwings that came bursting out of the bush. I remember flailing around with three iron, uh, about as effectively as I used to hit a golf ball with that three iron, so I didn't manage to hit them, uh, which was probably a good thing. But they dive-bombed me there, and I've been dive-bombed a number of times after that. But, you know, those birds don't generally actually hit you. They just make you feel a little bit like you're in an Alfred Hitchcock film. Right, Brent Leo Smith has made it all the way to Singapore. Let's go and find out if he's got any noodles to eat. Unfortunately, it looks like the noodles are few and far between. Uh, we are about three quarters away along the northern edge of Cheetah Plains. We're just making sure that there's been no movement of animals from the north into Cheetah Plains so far. There has not even been a Stenbock track crossing the road. But we are heading to that very productive eastern area on the Kruger boundary. And we're hoping that there we might have a bit more luck. Now, we did also have a quick squeeze at three in a row pan. Unfortunately, no sign of anything there. But I'm holding hope for the, the southeastern corner. 
I think that's going to be our best bet at Cats this morning. But it is a glorious morning. And we're about to meander towards the first of the large open areas. Now, as it warms up, you're probably going to find quite a lot of elephant movement coming through from the Kruger towards the water holes. So we'll be keeping an eye out for them. Uh, and maybe quite a few zebra as well. Of course, I always like to check on my good mate, Gnormless Gnorman the Gnu, and his arch nemesis, Normal Norman. Now, we're about to approach Normal Norman's part of the woods. So let's see if he's out and about. Now, for those of you who knew, that sounds a bit strange, Normal Norman and Gnormless Gnorman. So those are two dominant male wildebeests uh, that live on the two separate large open areas on cheetah plains. Uh, and they are both dominant bulls and they protect those short grass areas from other bulls. And what happens is the females will move from these different territories uh, mating with them, although they've finished mating now. And what that does is ensure a bit of a genetic diversity amongst the wildebeest populations. Every time we see lion tracks around old Gnormless's area, I always feel a bit worried for the old chap. Strange looking little thing. Let's have a look. Was it an elephant dragging a stick? Yes, it was. I got slightly excited. I thought it might be a drag mark. I'm going to have a look at it there. And it's an elephant dragging a stick across the road, not a leopard dragging an impala. Oh, at least we've got a set of tracks. There's an elephant track, there's a kudu track there. Oh, look. One of my favorite little, little birds. Let's just sneak forward a bit. And of course, if there's no large mammals around, they're always our feathered friends to keep us company. There's the female out in the open. Oh, you've got the male now. Okay. Come on, pop your head out. Now, oh, oh, there he goes. Very distinct head, that wonderful burnt amber almost. Oh, what color would you describe his head? Burnt, burnt amber, orange. Oh, off he goes. Now, the female's still following on the other. Oh, there he is. He's such a pretty bird. That is a male Koki Franklin for those who are looking to add to their bird list. So Koki and Shelley's Franklin, we hear more often than we see. So it's quite nice to catch them out in the open. It's actually two males, it's not another female. No, it's actually... Throat. Now, Justin S. is wondering, how can the brain of something as small as a bird be so complex? Well, Justin, you're going to have to ask the evolutionary scientists. Uh, now, in comparison to, to a mammal, a bird's brain, depending on the bird, actually, is relatively simple. And you will find with most wild mammals and birds and things like that, uh, their brains are complex, but it's based off a bunch of instinctive behaviors. So, um, no real process for true thought. Oh, there's the female. Is that a female? Is it another little male? Oh, she's scuffling. That's the female. Um, you can see that face mask and the white throat. Keeping up with her boyfriends. Isn't she lucky? She's got two. Now, they are very beautiful birds, and like with a lot of beautiful birds, they don't have the prettiest call about. These guys in particular um, have a call that could only dis be described as almost like rusty bed springs.
and see if I can find it for you. You can hear the little contact calls. And I often use those contact calls just to check where the other members of the flock are. But that's the Koki Franklin's call, as you can hear. There's that female. Oh, exquisite little creatures. There's actually how many? One, two, three, four, five, six of them. Now, the milk guard is wondering do we have pigeons out here? Uh, well, we do. In particular, we have a very interesting pigeon called the African green pigeon. I'm just going to keep watching it, Franklin, for a little bit, and I will show you what they look like. Oh. Okay, well, let's leave those Franklins. So, here's the African green pigeon. Very beautiful. And it's got zygodactyl feet, so it's able to clamber around like a parrot. And its favorite food is fruits. Now, Andrew is wondering, what is the romant most romantic bird out here? And I think that would probably have to be the red crested Koran. Now, often nicknamed the suicide bird, to impress the ladies, the males will fly vertically into the air, close their wings, and plummet to the ground. And then, about 10 meters from the ground, they open their wings and just land safely. So it's all to impress females, the red crested Koran. And I'll show you a quick picture of that one before we move on. Uh, let me see. Okay, there we go. And, oopsie. There is the red crested Koran. And that little red crest is actually hidden for most of the time, only when it raises its crest, when it's calling and in display before it does the suicide dance to impress the ladies uh, as it raised that red crest. Okay, so we've been sitting quietly watching the birds, chatting about birds. We haven't heard any sound of larger mammals, but as I said, we're probably about 60 meters from normal Norman, the GNU, or wildebeest, it's territory. So let's pop through, and see if there's anything on the first of the large open areas. Now, I'm secretly hoping, as we move towards the southeastern corner, that we might have a bit of luck with my favorite female leopard that we see on Safari Live, and that is Nkanyeni. And uh, this, she's the queen of the east. Uh, cheetah plains, coral, torchwood, although most of her territory falls with inside the Kruger National Park. Okay, so first, Wide open expanse, all oh, elephants. And we were hoping that elephants were going to be coming out uh, to the water holes, and there's a looks like a nice herd of cheetah plains pan. So we'll carry on on our boundary patrol in cheetah plains just now. Uh, but let's go catch up with those ellies while they're having a drink. Now, on cheetah plains, sometimes you've got to be a little bit careful how you approach elephants. Quite a few of them are coming out of the Kruger where there's no tourist roads and they're not used to seeing cars. Not all of them, so what we do is 
Oh, look at that. The water walk or the water run. Sorry, we're a bit far away, but it's... I'm thirsty, I'm thirsty, yay! Water. It looks like there might be another herd arriving. So it looks like we're bang on time to arrive at the Cheetah Plains pan. So what I'm going to do is, as we get a bit close, I'm going to start gauging their behavior a bit more carefully uh, to see if they're a relaxed herd or non-relaxed herd. look okay from here. It's very important to watch elephants carefully. And if they're not a relaxed herd, of course we don't want them to get upset. Maybe not the most relaxed herd, but not too bad. It seems like most of them have finished with their morning drink. and are heading up into the woodland to feed. Okay, no, they're not too relaxed. You can just see that female at the end there. She's feeling a bit panicked. I see that tail sped up. So we're not going to follow these elephants. We're not going to put too much pressure on them. We don't want them to have any negative connotations with our safari vehicles. So see that tail? It's a little bit stiff. There's a bit of stiffness in the body. And we're just going to watch them from a distance. Uh, let them get used to the vehicles, but there's a strong possibility that these elephants have come out of the Kruger and are not used to cars yet. See, there we go. They're feeling a bit more secure once they hit uh, some bush where there's some trees between us and them. You can see they've slowed their walk. Their body language is relaxed again. Okay, so we're going to leave those earlies. As I said, we don't want to put any pressure on elephants that aren't 100% relaxed around us. So we'll let them meander off into the broadleafed woodland to feed. Uh, James was asking if one of the cows only had one tusk. Uh, there's one female who's got no tusks by the looks of things, and there is a female with only one tusk. No small babies. Um, youngest probably being about three years old. And you can see, oh, they, they've slowed down, they're completely relaxed again. And we do have such wonderful sightings of elephants that there's no need to put pressure on elephants uh, that feel a little bit uncomfortable with our presence. And that's also one of the ways to get yourself into trouble with animals. And uh, it's very important to read each different animal uh, and even the same animal differently every day on their body language. That's how we keep safe and also keep the animals safe. So we're going to keep, we're going to go back to our northern boundary and continue our boundary patrol of Cheetah Plains and while we do that let's go see how James is faring back in the west. Uh, not much different from when you last saw us, but very interesting that, everybody, that, that a second unrelaxed herd of elephants there on Cheetah Plains. Of course, Vera and I had one the other day, a very small herd of five, and the matriarch, young matriarch, probably only about 25 years old, maybe 30, had only one tusk, and she chased us. And that is bizarre for this area at this period. I mean, I haven't been chased by an elephant for many, many years now out here because I would just seem to have developed that much more trust with them. And I'm interested now that there's another very unrelaxed herd on Cheetah Plains. Something may be going on in the Kruger. It's quite possible that that herd has just come out of the Kruger. And, you know, there is a fairly large wilderness block there. Maybe they're just not used to people. I don't know if it was reacting to Brent the herd or if it was just um, I don't mean Brent personally I mean the vehicle obviously and um, or if it was just unrelaxed anyway so very interesting that we shall watch it carefully and as Brent says it's extremely important to be watching their behavior of animals especially if you suspect something's making them uneasy
And elephants, of course, the ones that you've got to be the most careful of. Especially if you're a little inexperienced. The first thing I used to tell new trainees was when you are in an elephant sighting, you make sure that if you have to leave quickly, you can do it forwards with a relatively clear route in front of you. You don't want to be reversing away from elephants coming at you uh, because what happens is you tend to get a little fixated on what's going on in front of you and you just start going backwards and you don't look where you're going. And then you end up on a termite mound with an elephant on your bonnet, which is not much fun. That wouldn't be fun, would it, Eggsy? No. No, it wouldn't. We're giving up on these two leopards. Um, I'm missing exactly the name here, but a question about what time of year elephants have their babies. And the answer is... Oh, sorry, MC, you're wondering what time we have, when elephants have their babies. The answer, MC, is that there is no fixed time for elephants to have their babies. Let's just stop here a second. Just because there's a little bit of an alarm call going on in here. This is Hoffman's to the right-hand side of your screen. I'm just going to get up onto this termite mound here and have a look. So, MC, a, an elephant herd doesn't have a specific time of year, they will probably peak their birthing season around about the wet season. There'll be a sort of peak, but there's no specific season. And of course an elephant has a an elephant has a gestation period of about twenty two months. So there's never really a fixed time for them to give birth. Can you hear that? Can you hear the music, Igzy? Do you know how to turn the microphone up? Have you turned it up yet, Igzy? Having a nightmare there, aren't you? Igzy, are you leaving me hanging here? Have you turned it up yet? Grief man, how difficult can it be? You got it. Can you hear the music? No, I can't carry on dancing. So I can hear music coming out of the communities over there. It sounds like it's just behind the next Valonites tree there. It isn't. It's about four kilometers away. Can you hear it now? Still can't hear it, but the mic is on. Wait, the wind's changed now. <laughs> Here it comes. Not? Eggsy's having a hopeless nightmare this morning, everybody. Can't see them. any leopards in there. <laughs> it's not uncommon on a Sunday morning like this to hear the late night revelers still going for it in Dixie Village, which is about, well, it's five kilometers from the gate as the crow flies in that direction, probably about five, four or five kilometers. <laughs> what do you think of my dancing skills there, Eggsy? It couldn't be better, or could be better. Could be better, I see. Well, Eggsy, let's see what you look like with your beard attached to a Zizifus bush. Let's see, could be better. <laughs> I thought I looked like Will Smith in Men in Black there. Sorry, I'm really struggling to hear Rebecca this morning on the back end of radio transmissions and difficulties. Go again. Troy, I got that. Why do some animals fall fall fall? fall? Force. Force abort. Force abort. Oh, you mean sort of a spontaneous abortion of fetus. Okay, right. I've got you now. Sorry. 
Rebecca will have to have some elocution lessons when we get home. No, it's not her fault at all. It's the radio's a bit sort of uh, crackly this morning. Uh, well, Troy, it's, because it's new, normally got to do with nutrition. So if there's a bad nutritional time like this, like this drought, you'll find that the female may well uh, spontaneously abort a fetus because she can't cope with having um, the child and she can't produce enough milk and she cannot maintain the... Um, Oh, come on. She cannot maintain the placenta, and therefore it's basically she's either going to die if she tries to keep the baby, or um, the baby will, and they'll both die. So she aborts the fetus. And that's not entirely uncommon, but it's normally got to do with nutrition. You'll hear remarkable stories of uh, how mammals are able to reabsorb the fetus. I'm yet to see an actual biological explanation uh, that that actually happens so I don't believe it does unless the fetus is very very young an impala of course which are now on the right hand side Exi those are those uh, sort of reddish things there well done I'm going to now insult you basically continuously for the rest of the drive because you were insulting about my dancing skills um, they are renowned for, well, legend has it that they're able to hold back their fetuses um, in times of adverse conditions. And one of the reasons people thought that, it, it's definitely not true, but one of the people reasons people thought that is that they sometimes just don't give birth at the right time. And that will be because of these spontaneous abortions. And hopefully that won't be necessary this year. But this is the kind of year where it could be necessary. So if we don't get rain sort of uh, between now and the end of November and the grass does not improve, then you could well have a situation where some of them might spontaneously get rid of the fetus before it's born. What's he eating there, Eggsy? It's quite interesting. Well, it's just the tufts of last bits of grass there. The reason they're concentrating on that particularly uh, seemingly denuded piece of land is that it's actually part of that vast termite mound there. And that vast termite mound ex will extend sort of the same again, well, no, probably three or four times that under the surface of the soil. And so where those impala are grazing, the soil is particularly rich and therefore good for grass and grazing. All right, Eggsy the beard, soon to be Eggsy the Zizifus beard. Let us carry on. What an absolute cheek. <laughs> I think he thought if he mumbled it into his beard, I wouldn't notice. No, no, no. <laughs> Cape Tonians are taking uh, honesty to, too far. All right, we're going back on towards Juma. I'm going to go towards the eastern sector now and see if we don't perhaps pick up tracks of Karula or maybe some elephants coming this way who are slightly less irritated than the ones Brent had. Joanne from Arizona, what a very good comment. You say, I, you, I remind you of the groundhog dancing in its hole. I can only think that you're thinking of the gopher in Caddyshack. Is that correct? Uh, brilliant, brilliant film. And yes, I can imagine exactly why you would have seen my dancing style as similar to that of the gopher in Caddyshack. Before I say something else ridiculous, let's head across to Brent and find out what's happening with those elephants. Well, we've traded the largest land mammal for the tallest. Uh, a little bachelor group of giraffe. Uh, they are not inside cheetah plains, however. 
They are Kruger National Park giraffe. And you can see one, two, three, four giraffe. Unfortunately, they are directly to the east in the very, very bright light. So we'll just have to deal with the silhouetted giraffe. But nice to see a, a sizable group, and four together. And we don't often see big groups of giraffe in this part of the world, as uh, we don't have that many acacia trees. Now, to the east of here, in the Kruger on the Basalt Plains, I've seen groups of, from one spot, I've been able to see about 60 giraffe. Enjoying a breakfast of guari. <laughs> Funny looking creatures, giraffe. So, young males, uh, well, three of them are definitely young males. Uh, the fourth I can't really see behind the bushes. Uh, the one feeding off the guari bush there is the oldest of the, and the tallest of the giraffe we can see. Ah, number four is also a young male. So a little bachelor group of young males, not big enough and old enough to challenge uh, a big male for breeding rights just yet. So not too worried about hanging around with all the boys until they get a bit bigger. So there's one, oh, there's five, two, and then you can see Five giraffes here. Let's try and move a bit forward. We might be able to get a better view. So you can see one, two heads in silhouette. And you can see number three off to the right, number four in between, and number five is out at the back. Let's just see, there should be a nice little window coming up. There we go. How's that, Brian? There we go. Peering at us. I mean, we can actually hear them chewing from here. <laughs> it's a two-headed giraffe. Oh, no, just one. So you can see all young males. Uh, number five is about to come into shot from the left of the one we're looking at now. We'll wait for him to walk through. There you go, there's number five. Five boys all together. Michael, who's 18, says, where are all the female giraffes? We've only been seeing bulls recently. Well, Michael, I think with the drought, they've probably moved through to acacia-rich areas on gabbro and basalt soils. And, of course, they have to... There's six! Every time I look, another one appears. Six young male giraffe. Brian, you were saying the most you've ever seen in the group here is seven. Yeah, I think seven. Well, we're getting close. Maybe uh, another one is going to pop out to equal. Now, the one nice thing about spending time with little bachelor groups like this is quite often they will play fight. And it's called necking when giraffe swing their necks and hit each other. But these guys look like they're more focused on feeding. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six giraffes, definitely. Come on, Brian, let's find seven and eight, set a new record. Can anyone remember what is the most giraffes we've ever seen on a group, in a group here on Safari Live? Uh, let me know, questions at wildearth.tv uh, or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. What is the most giraffe you've seen in a group here? on Safari Lab. I think it's seven was mine as well. I'm quarantined. Mm. Yes, I do remember that sighting. Uh, 
I'm just going to move forward a little bit. Now, Georgie is wondering, at what age do giraffes finish growing, or they, do they continue to grow throughout their life? Um, I think, if I remember correctly, they finish growing at around 15, and they live for, or maybe even a bit younger than that, about 10, between 10 and 15 years old, and they live for about 30 years, so quite long-lived. Looks like we're not going to break our record, Ryan. Only six, but I'm trying to peer through the white light into the distance to see if there's not one or two more. Ah, right, seven! There's seven. See them through the gap there. So, we go right in the distance, um, so a little bit further to the left, and zoom. A little bit to the left again. You just see the head popping out left. There we go. Number seven in the distance. Now, another young male. Okay, so we've equaled our record. So this is definitely the largest bachelor group of giraffe we've seen. Come on, where's number eight? Or do you think that's too wishful, Brian? Mm. Let's move forward a little bit and see if we can spot an egg. And as I said, unfortunately, they are in very harsh light up against the eastern horizon. So let's just say we've had eight or seven, I was being premature there, silhouetted giraffe. Well, there we go, seven. We've equaled the most giraffe in a group record for Safari Live, seven. And I'm hoping for eight. What we might do is because it looks like they might move on to Cheetah Plains a little bit later, is we're going to go check the southern open area and then come back and maybe they'll be out in the open and we can break that record on this sunrise safari. So we're right on the boundary of the Kruger National Park. So Alice is wondering, at what age do female giraffe force the males to leave their... M oh, sorry, the male giraffe force the females to leave their sons? Uh, probably when they're about... Oh, what's that? Mm, no, sorry, false alarm. Stick cheetah. Uh, but uh, I'm not actually 100% sure, but I would guess it's probably around sexual maturity, probably 7 to 10 years old. Uh, maybe even a bit younger. But with giraffe, because they don't live in, in set herds and have set territories, it can be very variable that you could find a young male still hanging around with his mom, even while she's starting to mate again with other males. Okay, so we're going to head towards the southern open areas, and uh, fingers crossed that we're going to find a sign, or even better, find Inkanyeni, my favorite female leopard on Safari Live. And while we do that, let's go see how James is doing in the West. Very, very impressive to have found some vanishing giraffe, wouldn't you say, Eggsy? Yeah. We have found some non-vanishing dica, which is quite nice. And they're just very picturesquely sat here amongst the leadwood trees at the very base of the Juma concession. Is that not picturesque, Eggsy? Very. Yes. The sun is warming our faces. The cold front I've predicted is, uh, well, not materialized. And way in the distance, I can hear the call of, of the southern boo-boo. Oh, so nice. Very peaceful Sunday scene. Mm. Delicious. Delicious, delicious. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you anything further about big game species, as Brent Lear Smith likes to call them, the hairies and scaries. <laughs> if I ever use that term again, please slap me over the back of the head. 
Only Brent can get away with that. Yes, I can. What have you got there? Yeah. Well, they're still there. They're still there, yes. They're not vanishing diker like in Brent's giraffe. All righty, let's continue. We've just come now to the point where we're at Twin Dams, basically. It's Twin Dams off to the left-hand side of your screen, which we're not going to show you because it's not looking quite as picturesque. It's still a bit scarred after it was cleaned out for the rain. It will become less so as soon as we get some water on it. And we were just going to come into this area to see if we could see any Kurula tracks heading up or down. Nothing so far, just a few baboon tracks. In fact, that might be quite interesting to show you in the absence of anything else. And there we are. Can you see that track over there? So if I get out, you're not going to say, I can't see it. Are you sure you can see this track? Yeah. You're very sure? Yeah. Okay, good. It is a, it's actually not a baboon, I think it's a monkey. Mm. No, it could be a small baboon. Anyway, what you can see here, I'll show you this one first. This is the back foot. There. There's the thumb, and there are the four fingers. So they've got sort of opposable toes, if you know what I mean. And a monkey, we were talking about bipedalism and you know, the, the fact that human beings can stand upright. Monkeys can stand upright, and I've seen them standing upright, but they can't really walk. They can move a little bit like that. They kind of waddle along, and then they inevitably fall over because they can't maintain that. They've got a totally different foot structure, totally different ankle structure, and totally different attachment of the sort of hips to the spine. And that's why they walk with a very flat, um, you know, their ankles are, are set much further up the back of the foot and they're able to sort of, they're much more flexible than ours are. Ours are pretty un inflexible. Then here, in fact, these are definitely baboons. If you find a monkey with a hand that size, get out of the way. And you see this one. There's a hand. And you can see the thumb there and the fingers, one of which I've managed to draw over. So about the size of my palm, I suppose, that baboon's hand, and not a very big one. Uh, they normally they can get up to sort of half the size of my hand, their hands, uh, but they're obviously incredibly powerful, much more powerful than we are. This is a perfect spot to stop and have a cup of coffee. It's a beautiful bird song, sun warming the face, Sunday morning, but we'll continue on and try and find some large animals. What are we going to find, Iggsy? Some? Correct, not hairies and scaries. Good, well done. On we go. I think those monkeys have probably headed towards, or baboons, have headed towards that jackalberry tree. Let's go and look there. The jackalberry tree has been fruiting highly productive for primates of late. into the river, the roaring torrent. You all right there, Eggsy? Good, good. Smell of potato bush, another wonderful smell of this time of year. So nostalgic for me. Takes me back to when I was romancing a girl in the bush once. She's now married to someone else. Oh well. Now, Iggy, there's quite a nice bird there. Oh, don't go away. Can you see it there? It's a spotted thick knee. That's the one. And we don't often see them nicely during the day. They're largely nocturnal. And let's see if we can get another view. There might be a water thick knee. I didn't see it properly. I know there is a couple that lives next to Twin Dams. I think they're also starting to think about having a nest. They're in there. Can you see them there? I'll just can show you the difference between the two. 
It used to be called a dikop, which means thick head. Now they're called thick knees. Don't ask me why. It was indeed a water dikop. There you are. And the difference between that, of course, and the spotted dikop is eggsy. What? These sp spots. spots. Well done. Good. Yes. Spotted dikop, very spotted. Water dikop, not so much. If you see them just quickly, you can see that line there. It is very clear on the water dikop. Marvellous. Very good. On we go. We'll just pop across to this jackalberry tree up here and see if there isn't something there. Mm. Aaron, in New Zealand, you say you're looking forward to the springtime when we'll find a little few more birds, a few more waterfowl, perhaps. Uh, yes, I am too. But of course, we're not going to find more waterfowl if we don't have quite a lot more rain, which I think we should do. But when, those wa when these water holes do fill up, we'll have some lovely birds to look at. There's another diker. There are baboons. Look at them coming out of the tree there. See that? desperately don't want to get caught in the tree with us coming up so close. Isn't that fascinating? They don't feel safe in a tree and it's a common, common thought. And a baboon or a monkey, if a human being comes along, will go into a tree. They do exactly the opposite because they don't know how well we can climb. They don't know that we're incompetent in trees. So they get very nervous and they start peeling out of the trees as soon as we get near. There's another one coming down now. Big baboon coming down out of the tree. There it goes, running across there. Oh, it's very sad that they're so unconfiding. I mean, they will get used to people eventually. Because they're wonderful to look at. And another diker. Well done, Eggsy. That is the 75th diker we've seen today. Now, let's ease our way, I think, up the drainage system here and see if we can't pick up a few more baboons. They're just sitting up in the sun there. I can't see any more in the tree. No. You see them there, eggs? Just tell me when you want me to stop. They're not being particularly brave about seeing us, I must say. You got them there. Yeah, they are. There we go. <laughs> Sat down, like Lord Muck. They are endless entertainment. If you can get them to sit still, they really are fascinating to sit and watch. Mainly because, of course, they look so very human. You see what I mean by the ankle joint there? It's longer than ours and stretches up. And you may have just heard a little bit of groaning and grumbling. It wasn't, in fact, a diker being killed by a leopard. It was Eggsy's stomach. Eggsy, are you hungry? A little bit. Well, we've got quite a long time before breakfast, my friend. You're going to have to hold it together. We might find you some jackalberries to eat. Let's carry on. <laughs> See what else we can find along here. Very, very old buffalo skull here, Eggsy. Do you see that? It is so long dead. It is almost a fossil. Oh. 
can hear the music again, but that's not why I've stopped. Siberia Zumi, I've just heard a greater blue-eared glossy starling going. We'll go back a bit and see if we can't see it quickly. So, what I think is quite interesting about this buffalo <coughs> skull is that it's disintegrating. You see how the horns are slowly being eaten away. Eventually, all of this calcium will disappear. And if, as I've said to you before, I think there's a, often a misnomer that a fossil is in fact a skeleton that's just been preserved. Um, it isn't. This bone will not last forever. It will, it, you know, under the action of sediment, or sedimentation, it could form a fossil, but it will disappear into the earth and become part of the dust of the earth again, well, within probably a few years, but it won't last for very long. It looks a little bit like it's been placed there as a prop. That <laughs> Eggsy can't hear the music. I'm beginning to think I'm going mad. But every Sunday morning I hear it, so I'm not convinced that I am mad. Let's go back a little bit and just see if we can't find this greater blue-eared glossy starling for Siberia. No, I don't see them. Hmm? No, my earpiece is in. I got that. I already mentioned that it was Siberia Zumi who was looking for the starlings. All right, let us uh, go across to Brent and get an update from him. He has been off the vehicle tracking something, so let's find out what it was. So we found tracks of Inkanyeni, the female leopard I'm looking for. Unfortunately, they head straight south into Malamala, where she has been keeping her cubs. But it's always worth stopping and having a look around this large open area. I can't see my mate, uh, Gnormless Gnormin, at the moment, but maybe he's around, resting under a bush somewhere. Now it looks like we're not the only ones checking the open area. There's a vehicle from the south also having a look. Spotted Gnormless yet, Brian? Where is he hiding? And it is beautifully quiet and peaceful up here, or down here in the east. Very, very, very little in the way of mammalian wildlife. <laughs> but we do have some birds to add to the birding list. Oh, there we go. There's a crowned lapwing. Now, I know we're looking for all the starling species possible, but we can also do, I think we can do a fair shot at lapwings. I think James already had a discussion with a blacksmith lapwing. Now, I wonder if this crowned lapwing is running towards us. Is he running to towards us to tell us there's a cheetah present? Somehow, I don't think so. I think. What do you got, Brian? Oh, well done, virtual starlings. I think James got those. I think the Mala Mala guy is spotted in Ganyeni and the cubs, possibly all male cheetah. So we're going to be doing the sneaky safari. Let us see where. What on earth is he off roading for? What do you think, Brian? Think cheetah or leopard? Both cheetah and leopard in the same tree. Or possibly lions. Let us stop opposite him. Oh, he's not gone too far or too deep into the bush there. I think it's time to pull.
pull out the binoculars. What on earth have you seen, Mr. M Mr. Man? Now this is the area where Nkanyin has been keeping the cubs. Now what we're looking for, and normally I would never say this, but look where the cameras are pointing. <laughs> what I think also might be, he might be just checking the last position. I'm heading down deeper. Let's do the same. Now, unfortunately, there could be something behind the gory bush that we're not going to be able to see. I just want to check in that tree. No, there's nothing there. Oh, I think he might be fishing, just like we are hoping. But we did get some interesting birds out here on the open area last time I was down here. So let's see if we can get some more around this little water hole. So far I can only see some ring-necked doves. And if we look carefully, often there might be a little wader taking advantage of this little bit of water. Not today. Last time we were here, we had a wood sandpiper, if I remember correctly. Mm, not today, just the dove. Now oh, there's some very noisy lap wings up in the sky. Hear that constant calling. Uh, I'm also just checking the far end of the open area for those male cheetah. Now, when you use binoculars over a big open area like this and you're using them to hopefully spot something, there's a wonderful technical term for it. It's called glassing. I'm busy glassing the open area. Alas. Not much out there. Hi, Michael. Michael's 18. Michael says his favorite bird is the Woodlands Kingfisher and he'd like to know when are they going to return. Michael, I actually was having a discussion about that with a friend of mine last night, about when will the woodlands return. Now, normally it's almost without fail between the 12th and the 15th of September. However, I just want to look at one thing in the tree, far away down there. Nope, I thought I saw a leopard in the marula in the distance. But it's not. Sorry, Michael. Distracted there. Uh, so, Michael, uh, I think with the drought, it's going to be a very difficult one to call. And uh, they might arrive a little bit later. It also depends how much rain's been had further north in Africa on their migratory route. But uh, normally you can bet between the 12th and the 15th of September with pretty fair, fair certainty. But I'm not sure that with this dry weather, this drought we're having, whether that's going to be the case. Cheetah stump again. <laughs> okay, let's check back towards the Cheetah Plains pan. And over the last section of the open area, looking for my mate Gnormless. Now, okay, 
Let's go back towards the Cheetah Plains pan. And I was hoping for some wonderful little grassland bird species, or the short grass plains, but alas, no luck so far. And one of that nice little grassland species we get here is the African pipit. Uh, of course, we've only, I've only seen them once. I think Jamie's seen them, and James have seen them all down here on Cheetah Plains. Uh, is a Temex corsa, the smallest of the corsa species that really love these short, short grasses. Mm -hmm. Not even Gnormless Gnorm in the Gnu. Oh dear. Should I be worried for my mate? Ah, I think he's fine. Well, while we continue to search for a heartbeat, a mammalian heartbeat here on Cheetah Plains, it sounds like James has found one on Juma. My favorite antelope heartbeat, everybody, the Nyala. <clears throat> There's a fairly substantial herd of them now walking down towards where the first one was going. A whole lot of cows glistening in the sunshine there. And quite a lot of bird activity suddenly. Chin spot battises. Might be able to hear the Apolis going whack, 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 whack. It's an appalling rendition of its call. I might just play it for you. So I don't think your microphone's pointing in the right place. Hello, Peggy. You want to know if Eland are part of the antelope family? They are indeed part of the antelope family. The antelopes are even bigger than a family, if you like. So they're... Uh, designation goes higher than that. They're a tribe, or almost an um, almost an order, but not quite. But yes, absolutely. Ilanta are quite closely related to Nyala. They are considered by many to be one of the spiral horned antelope. Can you hear the music yet, Eggsy? I can hear something. You can hear something. Well, that's good that you can hear something. It means you're not deaf. It's very important. <laughs> right, here's the Apollos call, everybody. This is the yellow-breasted. Come on. Oh, here we go. Yeah, that's what we're hearing. Just along the drainage line behind us. That's the yellow-breasted Apollos. And then one or two, also, we've got a few um, orange-breasted bushrikes. They've stopped now, but they were going... Beautiful morning. It really is a very stunning, relaxed morning, of course. I, do, I don't know why it fe feels like the weekend. It feels like Saturday, and yesterday felt like Saturday, but every single day out here is precisely the same as the next, so... I don't know why it feels like that. I guess it's probably from the fact that we were, you know, we grew up like that. And Charlotte, while we look at these last vestiges of the Chagalafids going off into the bushes there, you say, have we ever seen an Irland or a Roan here? No, Roan, I, as far as I know, Roan has never been seen here. Irland, yes, once or twice, not common, probably once every four or five years or so they'll come through the Sabi sand, maybe one or two lost individuals. But sable, well, once every year or so, a sable bull is seen wandering through here and then it disappears and sometime, I mean this time last year, a sable bull was spotted on the Juma Dam cam walking across the Juma Dam wall. There's that orange bristled bush rock, just listen to that.
very nice, beautiful bird with an orange breast, surprisingly. Hmm. Alrighty, let's carry on. We're heading towards Buffelzook Dam to see if uh, we won't be as lucky as we were yesterday when everyone had been through there as we pitched up. Now uh, the lions arrived. There's a little baby Nyala. We'll see if we can't get a decent look at her or him or it. Here's his mum, so I think we probably will get a decent view of him. Look, look, look at the little thing. Tiny. Mum stands about three, three and a half feet at the shoulder. So when the little one runs in behind it, just over a foot, you know, just over a foot tall. Look. Isn't that sweet? So they're not particularly seasonal breeders, the Nyalas. They will have a peak in the rainy season, but you can see there. I mean, that thing's no more than a month or two old. Very, very sweet. <laughs> Julie, you're wondering about colic in animals out here. Um, I think colic is probably a fairly wide-ranging term. I stand to correction here. But colic is probably a fairly wide-ranging term that describes a number of stomach ailments or gas, I think, in the stomach. Now, we know that human beings get what we call colic uh, when we're little. But I think you're probably referring to the colic that the horses get. Now, as far as I remember from my days as a, as a horseman, colic is caused by the fact, uh, well, sort of build-up of gas probably, or poor toxins in the belly. Horses cannot vomit. They can only breathe through their noses, and for some reason that means that they cannot vomit. And so you have to release something from the stomach and if a horse gets colic you've got to put a tube down its nose into the stomach and then kind of drain the stomach now I don't know about the the ruminants I don't think ruminants can get it I think ruminants can get many other different kinds of troubles in their stomachs but their stomach is so totally different from that of a zebra or a horse that I think the similar kind of thing is probably impossible. I imagine a zebra can possibly get colic, but I also think that colic, as with most domestic animals, is probably a domestic animal disease caused by a strange diet and eating strange things and living in strange conditions. So I think it's probably quite unlikely that zebra get colic, and you certainly don't see them uh, sort of rolling around, writhing in pain very often, unless they're being attacked by a lion, of course in which case they do writhe around. So I'm going to say no, I don't think they do get colic much. I'm sure it does happen every so often. I don't think a ruminant can get colic though. The stomach is totally differently designed from that of a horse or a zebra. I was rather hoping that we might spot that lioness and her three little cubs somewhere around here. The Nkuhuma pride has been found on Bivol's Hook, but they can't tell me whether it's four or five lionesses. And I just wonder, given that we saw the lioness with her five cubs going up towards Bivol's Hook yesterday, whether our lioness with her three tiny little ones isn't still around here somewhere. She's been fantastic, you know, those little cubs are so fat. I think she's producing a lot of milk, and I think the longer she stays away from pride, actually the better it's going to be because those bigger cubs will push her little cubs off her and enjoy her milk as in the same way that her own cubs are doing so I personally think that for the benefit of her cubs she should probably stay away from the pride for a little bit longer let's just watch carefully around here she spent a long time around here she's definitely not here right now over there and Nyala in the midst of his dressage dance. That means there's another Nyala bull around here, somewhere, to whom he is displaying with his magnificent mane stretched up. Isn't that great? I think that's really lovely. Look how slowly he's moved. 
doing. We should take him about five seconds to land. I don't know where his competitor is, but probably to the left of him. Now, Nyala, as many of you will know, avoid conflict by doing these outlandishly ridiculous slow dances around each other. And I, for many years, thought, well, they didn't get very violent with each other. But I tell you what, if this dance doesn't... <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me again. If this dance doesn't sort the men from the boys, as it were, then they get very physical with each other. And it is a startling and astounding thing to watch two Nyala bulls face off and have a physical fight. Let's move a little bit forward. I think I can see the other one there. I can, but the other one doesn't seem to be vaguely interested in dressage this morning. He's just eating some, uh, eating some acacia bush, I think. See that? He's not paying any attention whatsoever. <coughs> and he's eating some zebra wood. While his mate walks past at... I don't know what you call a speed so ridiculously slow. There's also, I can hear, a woodpecker pecking around here somewhere. See if I can spot him. And even Eggsy, a humble impala. Let's just have a look at our impala there. It's that thing there. There, Eggsy, you see, I'm scratching his on, scratching his back leg there. Hello, Joey in Australia. A good one from you about black-faced impala, not to be confused with black impala. And as that one disappears, I'm going to ask Eggsy to see if... Can you see that blue wax ball on the ground there, Eggsy, with the camera or is the car in the way? Yeah, got, him. got him. Oh, there he is. He's sitting very nicely for us. Joey, black-faced impala you won't see here. They only occur in Etosha. They're a particular sort of... I'm not even going to give them the title of subspecies, but they're a particular group of impala that occur only in Etosha, in Namibia. And they're quite rare, and I mean, they probably could be considered endangered even, but they do not occur here. And they just look exactly like our impalas. I think they're slightly larger, um, but they have a sort of black stripe that goes down the face. And there's no other difference, really. Then you do get black impala, which is melanistic impala, completely black in colour. And they are kind of a, like a rare game breeders thing. You will find them very, 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 very rarely in the wild. But uh, you do get them, black impala, they're a bizarre thing to see. But a black-faced impala, Joey, only in Namibia, in Natasha. It was quite nice. We had some nyala, impala, waxbills, woodpecker pecking away. Hello. Just greeting the one who wasn't having a fight. Now past the one that's looking a bit ashamed that he was having a fight. Alrighty, we're going to, ooh, one second, just before we go across to Brent Leo Smith and find out if he has finally managed to find a Singapore noodle stand. Do you see that very vast bird over there, Eggsy? With your camera there, it's going to look like a wax bill. But uh, with these powerful binoculars, I'll be able to identify it. 
It is a batelier, Eggsy. A silhouette of a batelier. Looks like a splodge on your screen there, two pixels in height. So let's go across to Brent and find out how his hunt for a Singapore noodle breakfast is going. Well, it's got a bit better. We found another herd of Ellie's. And a bit more relaxed. Were they? But there's also what excites me the most. There's a massive Ellie bull right here. So I'm going to try and get a bit closer to him. Hello, big boy. Look at that. Oh, let me go forward a bit. Lovely set of ivory on him. Very even. So strong. Now Andrew's wondering, is it true that elephants can smell water from up to a mile away? Andrew, I'd say they can probably smell water from a bit further than that. I'm just trying to see if he's in must. He's not. Hello, big boy. Oh, he's massive. Oh, I love it when those bulls walk like that. He's got the water walk for, for trees. He's hungry. Oh, my goodness. He's trying to push down a massive saffron. Uh, he's decided it might be a bit strong. And let's see if he uses his height to pick off some of those saffron branches. that he's smelling something in the dirt and as he breathed out he created his own little dust okay let's see what he's up to there we go the reach using his height to get to some of those branches that other Ellie's can't get to. Oh, he just can't get a good enough grip to pull it down. <laughs> so he picks up a lower branch. Yeah, I'm just going to try it forward slightly. Oh, it looks like he might move out into the open for us. Beautiful big boy. Now, for those of you taking screenshots, let me just move forward slightly, get that pesky push out of the way, there we go. Now, from a photography point of view, this is an incredibly, and from a cameraman's point of view, a very incredibly difficult shot because of where he's standing in relation to the sun. So if you are going to take any screenshots, which I suggest you do, uh, think about converting them into black and white with that harsh white light behind might turn into be a very interesting picture. And remember to share those interesting pictures with us on our Facebook page, Safari Live, or on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live.
Roxanne's wondering, are there any problems with the younger elephants with loss of family structure? Um, not in this area, uh, Roxanne. The family structures are intact. Uh, that only really happened quite a few years ago uh, when young elephant bulls were introduced to an area where there were no big dominant bulls and they became a bit naughty. But if you've got big dominant bulls and stuff, those young elephants tend to behave quite well at the prospect of having a sorting out from a big boy like this. Oh, do you hear that, Brian? Is that a squirrel alarm calling? Mm -hmm. Yes. Let's go have a look quickly. We'll come back to the Ellie's if there's nothing there. As you can see, the elephants have blocked the road. where that squirrel sounded like it was around here. Yeah, some of these elephants spread out all through, but who knows, maybe we're lucky enough that the chief might be on their way back. Oh. Let's just switch off and listen. If he's Lord Squirrel's gone quiet. Okay. Sounds like some upset lapwings ahead of us. Come on, squirrel, shout again. That squirrel obviously is like, I can see the killer bees. Let's make a joke. Leopard, leopard, leopard. Ha, 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 ha. Evil squirrel. Hm. I just want to have a quick look down this open area. Maybe we can see what the lapwings are complaining about. So while we have a quick squiz down towards the, or up towards the north, see if we can see anything that the squirrels and lapwings were shouting at. Uh, let's go see how James is doing. I bring you bad tidings, everybody. Bad tidings, indeed. All of the lions are 70 meters in that direction. 70 meters. Just inside there, if you're working in feet, that's about 250 feet. Uh, <laughs> all five lionesses, two Birmingham boys, and eight cubs. Sorely tempted to trespass, but I'm not going to. Instead, we'll look at that vulture, which is very far away, sitting in a tree, surveying the Sunday scene. It is a white backed vulture. Not only is it a white back to vulture, it has also got a quite a full crop, which means it has probably been eating that buffalo carcass the Nkahuma pride rejected out of hand the other day, quite interestingly. Possibly died of some kind of disease, and the Nkahumas may have picked up on that. And I don't think, you know, you won't be able to tell from there, but the, the full crop is basically a swelling on the throat, it is still full of meat, and it's slowly being pushed down into the stomach. It's quite a good way if you're a bird that has to eat quickly and then fly away before you, be, before you get mauled by something. It's quite a good idea to be able to store a bit of food on you so you can fly off and sit in the safety of a tree like that. 
More of the magpie shrikes calling in the background. Very exciting that at least we've got some squirrels alarm calling now in uh, cheetah plains. Maybe Brent will be lucky. Maybe they're shouting at a slender mongoose, however. It's equally as possible as a leopard. But we'll hold our thumbs together. Right, our next port of call is going to be the Gallagher waterhole and see what's happening there. Because there ain't nothing happening at Bivelzook Dam. There was a tea party going on at Bivelzook Dam, actually. Some uh, guests from Vuyatel and Gallagher, they had stopped there to have their morning coffee. Didn't offer us any, did they? Eggsy, Eggsy's stomach started groaning again. And yet still, they did not offer us anything. Very rude, very rude. Tasha Michelle, you say are we not seeing any animals because they've all moved away because of the drought? Uh, no, I, we're not seeing any animals. I think it's quite by chance. You know, we just, the roads don't cover every piece of land. The elephants seem to have moved off again for a little while. That's not unusual. They do. They come and they go in great numbers. Uh, the lions are just across the boundary, so, you know, they could easily be this side, but they're just across the boundary, so we're not seeing them. Um, likewise, I'm not sure where Karulu and the Cubs are, but it won't be far from the southern boundary. So it's very much just a case of chance, you know, Tasha. It's just what happens. We've seen pretty good general game today. We've seen some nice Nyala, some nice Impala. We've seen 75,000 Diker between Eggsy and I during the course of the morning. Other birds have been pretty good. So it's just, it looks quiet because we haven't had any sort of high profile sightings. We've had elephants with Brent twice. And so it actually hasn't been a bad return, but we were hoping, you know, we go out in the mornings and we hope to find the big cats and that sort of thing. Oh, well, and <laughs> as I was saying, we go out hoping to find cats and cubs and that sort of thing, and sometimes it just doesn't happen like that. And Brent has found an elephant. Go and have a look. Well, it's actually the same Ellie's. Uh, when we couldn't find anything from the alarm calls, we decided to head back to that same bull. And I'm hoping he's going to move out in front of us now. He's just got his head behind the bush. Let's try a different spot, man. We'll get a nice window. that for you, Brian. Eating the roots of a bush willow. You can hear him crunching. Hey, big man. Oh, he's got, look at that one foot. He's turning that whole tree over. Oh, let's get to the roots on the other side. Done yet. Look at this. Incredible power. There we go. <laughs> Oh. 
so strong, the big Eddie balls. They're so wonderful spending time with these big Ellie bulls. They're incredibly powerful beasts. But at the same time, they do have a gentleness about them. Not if you are a bush willow, though. root from that tree and just pulled right out of the ground. I was hoping he was going to walk right up to us when he's finished munching away. Here's something I find really special about spending time with elephants. you read their behavior correctly, you're able to spend an incredible amount of time really close to these massive animals and very safely as well. Oops, sorry about that. Well, it sounds like you guys have got some great black and white screenshots uh, when it's always a good little trick from a photography point of view when you're looking straight at the very harsh sunlight even now as the sun gets higher quite often a lot of these photographs are going to work better in black and white especially elephants are one of the more difficult animals to photograph because they're so big and so gray and if you can get like now we've got really nice light on the one side of him you can see that I'll wait for him to finish pulling that out dust. Looks like the next little tree is in danger. There's a little sickle bush that he's broken the branch off. So we'll keep an eye on that big boy, but we've also got a nice... Oh, it's on the move now. Younger elephant to the right has been 
feeding behind us while we've been watching. Oh, there we go. like it was about to take out that small bush willow. Right. Digging out the roots there. Deciding it's not worth the effort. And someone else has already pushed that one down. Oh, Brian, the big boy is coming close to us. I guess. Looks like there's a bit of green grass under there. Oh, big man. to one of the biggest, well not one of the biggest mammal that lives on land. He probably weighs about 6,000 kilograms and he's about 15 feet from us. I'm guessing probably around 40 years old. just too special. I'm going to try to stick with this ball as long as we can. Oh, look at that quickly. Sorry, Brian, I just noticed it. Oh, stop doing it now. You're standing on the, <laughs> on the, on the tree. Big boy is now stopped on the right, in the right light. On the western side of the road. Hello, big boy. How's that, Brian? Deciding that pulse form isn't exactly what he wants right now. Oh, 
James Richard said he could just listen to the sound of an elephant feeding all day. The pops, cracks, rumbles. Uh, well, me too, James. It is one of my favorite sounds in the bush. But Lucy's saying you can just hear how dry it is with the way that all the branches break under the pressure from elephants. Let's see, where's he going? He's moving off. I think we're going to do the same. We're going to let him enjoy the rest of his breakfast. And uh, I've got one last lead that I'm going to follow up on Cheetah Plains. Let's see if we have any luck. I'm not going to jinx it by telling everyone what it is. Oh, he's going to go past out. That little Ellie, still feeding on the same bush. But the rest of the elephants have moved off. Oh, there we go, it's doing the stand on again. <laughs> Not quite as strong as a big one, so it doesn't just rip it out, utilizing its body weight. little one let's leave you be and just keep going see what else is out and about on the plains of the cheetah who knows maybe there's a cat surprise I'm hoping now it's got to go around the elephant elephant roadblock push that little tree across the road. Now, Matthew in Michigan would like to know how strong an elephant's tooth is. I presume you're asking about their tusks, Matthew. And they are incredibly strong. They do break, however, when they're fighting or sometimes when they're trying to upheave a tree that might be quite large. Oh, there's another younger bull. Oh, well, sorry, Matthew. Matthew said no, the elephant's actual eating teeth. Right. Matthew, we've got a lovely young elephant bull here. He's got a nice set of ivory for a young boy. Hello, little man. You've got very big teeth for a young boy. Now, Matthew, the actual teeth inside their mouth is a single tooth and they get a few sets through their through their life and they're incredibly strong uh, but what happens is they actually ground down till there's almost nothing left let's just try and maneuver with this young boy he's probably around 30 oh, sorry mister he's decided to change direction looks to be the last of the elephant herd. And there he goes. Heading off to the west. We're going to have one last dalliance in the south. Uh, hopefully it's a fruitful one. But, oh, these eddies are making our life quite interesting with all their road rearrangements. Avoid the big hole there. Okay, so while we head off to the south, uh, let's go back to James and see how he's doing. 
I have adopted a different strategy now. We've adopted the strategy of now cover as much ground as possible. I've s searched very gently and genteelly into every single bush that I've been past today and so far failed to find anything in the way of a cat or anything like that. And so now I'm driving much more quickly, as you can see. Eggsy is looking a bit more terrified on the back of the vehicle. His air beard is blowing gently in the wind. Yes, it's exactly what Eggsy just said. Ex Ranger, you say, if we can't find some hairy and scary, why don't we go and see if we can't find that party in Dixie Village? Sounds like they're having a blast. I agree. I just suspect that by now there'll be a few stragglers there looking a bit bleary-eyed after a fairly heavy night of Dixie drinking. I'll see if Eggsy still hasn't heard the music yet, so I'm going to top here next to Sydney's dam and we'll see if we can't hear it for you. <laughs> oh, mm, Eggsy, there is the beastly thing itself. Can you see it there? Look, foul bird, harbinger of doom. The pied crow, everybody. Not usual in this area. If you keep a bird list, He's probably one of the foul birds not on it. And of course, there's the call. <coughs> Horrid call. I think ever since I was forced to read Thomas Hardy as a child, um, I've d disliked crows. They've always made me think of dull, dreary English weather and tragedy. It's not the crow's fault, of course, everybody. The crow just happens to have a bad voice. But it really does have a horrible bad voice. Anyway, let's see. We're just near Sydney's Dam now. See if we can't get a little bit closer to it and see if we can hear the party in Dixie. It sounds to me like it's come to an end, though. I can smell some water buck around. Obviously, I can't see any. Ooh, there, no, same starlings we've already seen. Sorry about that. So, Siberia, sorry about that. Hello, Sarah in Cape Town. You're a new viewer, relatively new viewer, and you want to know if there's going to be a fireside chat tonight, and you've never been to one before. Sarah, there is going to be a fireside chat this evening. Uh, the theme will be the Olympics. That's what our theme will be. There's a virtual starling Siberia. I'm afraid I've failed to find your greater blue-eared or a Cape Glossy today. Eggs, he's had enough of those. Um, <laughs> Hello, the Milk Guard. Another wonderful Twitter handle. You say, with us doing the Bush Olympics, how do we stay fit and healthy out here? Uh, well, the answer is that some people don't. Uh, some people stay inevitably unhealthy and unfit. Um, <laughs> some of us run, and we also have a, a little bush gym that we go to, which is, um, well, it's a couple of sticks tied to some trees where we do some pull-ups and push-ups and that sort of thing. Yeah, every day uh, a few of us try and do something. But it's not very hard if you, you know, if you, if you want to make the effort, it's really not that hard to do a bit of exercise. Some of the ladies do yoga and Pilates. I don't really understand either of them, but that's what they do to stay fit. We have a rowing machine if you want to do, use that. Unfortunately, it's in a rat-infested storeroom, so it's, you've got to kind of deal with the stench of ammonia in your nostrils while you do it. This is Sydney's Dam, and there are some impala there. There's the crow flying overhead. There it goes, Eggsy. Harbinger of doom flying over us, harbinging away. 
and it would seem that the party in Dixie Village has quieted. The last stragglers have made their weary way home or passed out where they stood. So Sarah, yes, a fireside chat today based on the Olympic theme. Two gold medals for South Africa this time round, I think. Two or three? No, just two. Both in on the track. 400 and 800 meters. Very peaceful. Right. Impala are moving off. We shall do the same. Let's head down Sandy Patch Road. It's the only road we haven't driven today. Not so easy. Let's probably do it quite quickly, hey? Simply because we need to cover more ground, see if we can find something in the way of a high-profile game species. Hello, Kimberly. You say, how do I keep my energy up all day? I don't. All day, Kimberly, I'll probably have a small collapse after we go off air, and then I'll pick it up again for when we go on air. Uh, Kimberly, I, I don't know. I, it just, uh, when the camera lens turns towards me, I don't find it very difficult to pick my energy up. Uh, this is probably because I have a very large ego, I suspect, uh, which is a distressing confession to have to make, um, but one must be honest. I suppose. It's also the joy of performing, Kimberly. For me, I, if somebody says that they've had a laugh at something I've said, well, then I just think it's the greatest compliment in the world. So I guess that's, that's what drives the, the energy while we're on, on game. So there's quite a lot of downtime between then and, you know, between drives when we can do various bits and pieces and recharge ourselves. Our male leopard came wandering down here yesterday. But I think he went off towards Simbambili, probably Mvula, his uh, coupling, if you like, with Shiluva complete. Hmm. Anyway, and I've heard nothing on the radio today about Shadow and Tingana. I don't think they've been found again. Hello, Nemo. Well, I, I, you want to know about false estrus and whether leopards can do false estrus in the same way that lions can. Nemo, I think you'll find that they probably do it for slightly different reasons. Just looking at some alarm calling birds here. Nemo, lions come into false easters to make sure that the males that they're going to mate with are A, going to hang around, and B, so that they can solidify bonds with them. But leopards don't really have that same kind of issue. You know, they don't live in it. Well, I suppose to a certain extent they do. Yeah, you know, if a new male came into an area, they may come into a, a false estrus. And for those of you who don't know, false estrus is when the female will come into a sort of estrus, but she won't actually ovulate. So she'll mate, but she won't ovulate. And that does solidify bonds with a strange new male who has come into an area and dominating it. So, yes, I would say leopards can. But uh, why I was kind of a little doubtful about it, or what I'm thinking about, is the fact that Karula mated six times with Tingana before she produced this latest off, uh, crop of offspring, Shongile and Hosanna. And I wonder if some of that wasn't a false estrus of some sort. I don't think she's had cubs with him before. I think it's always, well, I mean, I think there have probably been various over the years, but Mvula was the last one that she had cubs with. And, yeah, so I don't know, maybe the fact that she, uh, was, these were her first lot with Tingana made her come into some sort of false estrus. I don't know. Very interesting question. Good one. Thank you. But I think it's well possible. Now we have some more starlings, Siberia. We'll try and get you at least two of the five before we shut down. I think they're Birchels again, I'm afraid. I can't believe this. 
They're not. Right. See the bird? I don't know if you... Can you get the camera up there? It's a Cape Glossy or a Greater Blue Ear Glossy Starling, and the only way we're going to know... Can you get it up there? The only way we're going to know is if it calls. Sorry, this light is in the way. Let me go back, show forward back, sideways. Siberia, Eggsy is doing his best for you. Let me play the call. I'm going to play the call of the greater blue-eared glossy starling. Let's see if that's what this is. Because he'll probably respond. Lots of midday bird song now. You got in there. Eggsy is just uh, changing the camera up a little bit in order to get the angle. I could just move the car, Eggsy. It will help. Do you want to go forward or back? Forward. forward. There we go. Yes? Uh, yeah. Oh, well done. Now. <laughs> Let me play the call of the great blue-eared glossy starling. Here it is. That one is not reacting. Therefore, let us play the call of the Cape glossy starling. This one's stubbornly, stubbornly refusing to say anything at all. This is very irritating. Siberia, I cannot tell at this angle whether that's greater blue-eared or Cape Glossy, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. <laughs> and it's just a big black blob. Hooray! Brent Leo Smith has found something that we haven't seen today. It's hairy, but it ain't scary. And I'm as chuffed as cheese to let you know that Gnormalus Gnormen, uh, the Gnu, the dominant male of the southern plains of Cheetah Plains, is alive and well and still without girlfriends. Don't worry, Normalus, summer's coming, your lush green grass will grow, and all the ladies will come to you. Oh, Normalus is staring in the direction where we can hear some elephants. And he's on his way into normal Norman's territory for a foray or a drink at the Cheetah Plains Pan, is my guess. Be careful, Normalus. I didn't see normal, but there could be. Well, the arch rivalry continues. But from uh, the killer bees, uh, hopefully we're going to be able to find a bit more on the sunset safari, but it has been fantastic uh, and beautiful. And we did see a record equaling number of giraffe in one group today, seven. So we know eight is the number to do. And there's the thumb to say toodaloo. And of course, there's the ranger race and, well, we have to discuss it. Brian and I have been discussing, since we are the killer bees, and since we are on Rusty, we might have to give James plus five uh, heartbeats to start. That's how confident the killer bees are. Anyway, from uh, the killer bees, it's been wonderful having you, and uh, we will see you in a few short hours for the sunset safari and the exciting ranger race, and, of course, fire chat. Toodles! That's very kind of uh, Brent to give me a plus five head start. I'll take it, thank you very much. He'll now not be able to take that back. And when he loses, he'll say, oh, but I gave you a five uh, head start. I'll say, yes, but you said you wanted to give me a five plus five head start. So I'll take it, thank you very much. I have already five. I'm not sure what I've got five of. Rebecca, what have I got five of? Five points of what, Rebecca? Mammals, birds, amphibians, arachnids, 
Oh gosh. Not even Rebecca knows what's going on. We'll have to find out from somebody with a brain sometime after breakfast. But there will be a ranger race during the, sort of in lieu of the Olympics today. It will not be a physical race. We've had that and then you will see how that turned out. And you will see Brent and I uh, in some sort of, well, I'm not going, I'm going to save it for you. It was very well filmed by Eggsy. Ah, for every heartbeat we get a point. Okay, excellent. So it can be birds, reptiles. Uh, what happens if it's an insect? An insect doesn't really have a heart, strictly speaking. We'll approve it. So anything, basically, any form of animal life, not a flower. I wonder if we find a sea sponge, if that will count. Good, well I've got five already, that's excellent. That's very kind of Brent to give me those. I'll take them. <laughs> so that is going to happen during this afternoon's sunset safari. And then we will have a surprise visit at the fireside chat from the great Olympic champion himself, the Bush Olympic champion, um, I'm not sure if anyone's told you who the Bush Olympic champion is, but I can tell you that it is not me and it is not Brent. It is someone else in the camp who has managed to achieve greatness in athletic and, well, even film prowess during the course of the last little while. We are going to stop here at the entrance to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where it is that we all live and we shall bid you a fond farewell on the back end of some blue wax bills over there, those blue birds there. Exe, that's it. Well done. You moved with Capetonian smoothness there. It's the only advantage to a Capetonian. There we are. Look how pretty their colours are shining in the sun. Isn't that lovely? I think that's really pretty. Keep on them. Don't go anywhere from them, Exe. We ain't going to find anything else in 60 seconds. Hmm? There's a whole bunch of them. Good grief. Our cup runneth over. In the background, Siberia, you might be able to hear the greater blue-eared glossy starling going. Okay, everybody, that's going to be it from us today. Well, not for the day, just for the morning. Thank you, Eggsy, for your efforts. A big thank you to Brent and Brian on the other vehicle. And, of course, to Rebecca in the final control, being ably assisted by Louise Pavid. Mostly to all of you for consistently keeping things going during a quiet drive. We will see you this more afternoon at 3 o'clock. Until then, stay safe and happy. Bye-bye. <laughs>